I'm backing up my truck, I'm gonna hook it up, loading up my boat with all my gear. I've been working hard all week, trying to make ends meet, spending time wishing I was fishing. Oh, Terry Wickstrom wants to take you fishing. Gather up your gear and come along. Well, Terry Wickstrom wants to take you fishing. This is Terry Wickstrom. Join Karen Collum, Greg Collagio, and me as we take you to some of our favorite fishing spots from Colorado to Minnesota, the Arctic Circle to Central America and beyond as we revisit episodes of Mountain States Fishing and Angling Adventures Television on the best of fishing with Terry Wickstrom. Well, I'll tell you what, if you can hear me over this, we're at a chicken ranch. <laughs> Believe it or not, and that sound behind us is roosters. Now you might say, fishing show, what are you doing at a chicken ranch? Well, we're at Whiting Farms, and Whiting Farms is the largest producer of feathers, I believe the largest producer of feathers for fly tying in the world. But I gotta tell you how we ended up here. Steve, Steve is the, works for Whiting Farms, and if you, if you listen to me on the fan at all, when this guy starts to talk, you're gonna understand, hear his voice. This is Mark Mosier from the 950 The Fan Sports Talk. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Terry, how are you? I'll tell you what, I, I put out a challenge because Mark said he hadn't been fishing in years, Steve from Whiting Farms answered that challenge, said, I'll take Moj fishing. He goes, I work on a chicken ranch. Well, it turned out to be Whiting Farms. So we thought we'd get Mark on the water. We're going to get out and show, and we're going to float the Gunnison River. Rick down here is one of our guides. He's going to handle our, uh, he's going to roll the camera boat and help guide us. We're going to guide out of Pleasure Park. We're going to head down to the Black Canyon Anglers Resort. We're going to float that stretch of the river. Quick float in and out. We'll show you some of those accommodations. Try to get you into fly fishing. I'm going to try my hardest, Terry. I'm going to be casting all day long, baby. We'll see if we can get Mark to fish. But then we're going to come back and show you about growing chickens for tying flies. We'll get you out in the water. And we'll meet you back here at the farms after that. We're going to get out on the river, but hey, thanks for providing the accommodations today. Indeed, my pleasure. You're going to have the greatest time in West Central Colorado and the great number one stream in the state, the Gunnison River. And uh, Leroy provided the accommodations. We're using, uh, we, we slept in his cabins and we're using his boats and his guide. You want to introduce your guide to us you here? You bet. This is my head guide, Harvey Diedrichson. Harvey, thank you. We've got, um, who we got back here? This is uh, our driver. This is our beach bunner. And uh, our beach bunner, you set up all your boats today. He's going to have a suburban down there to pick you up. And uh, this is Roger Rule. Well, I'll tell you what, it's beautiful up here, folks. Great accommodations. They tell me it's great fishing. We're going to find out. <laughs> We're going to get out on the river and uh, go catch some of these trout here in the Gunnison River. You bet. Okay, you're dropping your rod tip a little too fast. Little That's too why fast. it's bunching on you. Okay. See how that fed out there that time? Yeah. See that's pulling you like that? Yeah, you don't want that. Do you? That's when you need to pick it up and put her back out. You know, Harvey, I didn't realize there's such a fine art to this, you know, and trying to fool these fish into thinking that, you know, you've got something that they want? Well, you know, I had a friend tell me that they just have a brain the size of a pea, you know, but they seem a little bit smarter than that to me. That one of our new, new little guys. Little one, but good way to start, get us started. Got him, Harvey? Little Brown? Yeah, Little Brown. Hey, Brown, get the day started. Trying to like get Moses with fish, I held off as long as I could. You'll need to the camera real quick. Tried to get motion. Make sure you wet your wet yeah, your hand. Get the net with something to Tried to get motion started first, but I couldn't wait anymore. So I just friendly little brown, beautiful fish. The colors are just awesome. Not a big fish, but a good one to start the day and get us going. We'll get him back in the water and we'll get back to the task of getting Mark Moser into a fish. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy said good luck about getting Moser into a fish. Tell me they don't like my casting, is that you're telling me? Those guys are floating down there pretty good. See my guys out there, Terry? Uh -huh. They're floating out there, just hanging out, you know, doing their thing. You'd think it looked tasty enough, wouldn't you? You know, the thing about a guy like me, I've been fishing these waters for, gosh, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And uh, with that kind of experience, Harvey's going to hook me up with the atomic nymph here. This thing apparently is, uh, is nuclear powered. Fish can't resist it. 
Uh, we're gonna see what that does for us. Now Terry's already got himself a, about a three inch brown trout, which he's proud of, and I'm, I'm proud of him for it. But this atomic <laughs> nymph is- That was about eight inches. I'm sorry, eight inch atomic nymph uh, trout. Uh, that brown trout was pretty nice though. It had nice color on it. How many do you got? My total is zero, but we're not counting right now. I'm just saying the next one I get is going to dominate that little eight incher you had. That was, that, was the, uh, that was the baby. I told him to go back and find his old man and grandpa. He's right here. Yeah, you He's got one right in front of us, too. I would let you cast, take that line and put it under your finger on the rod right away. Okay. That's yeah. your control. So that you can control that line. Okay. I'm just going to let that fly drift out there like that? Yeah. Look, we, we finally got some fish working down below us. Sure do. But what they're working on, I don't know. I don't see nothing on the water. Just let it drift just like that, huh? Yeah. He's right there. We're going right on top of him. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. There we go. Hit it. Oh, he had damn. it. You gotta set that hook. You gotta be a little quicker. Sorry, Terry. Boy, I tell you what, he wanted it too. You dirty dog. Come back to daddy. Come on now. Terry, life is about opportunity. You've had some opportunities, and we've got a lot of time left yet. We're going to hook you up. I had some prime opportunities for uh, So what do you think of fly fishing so far, Mullers? You know what, Terry, this is fantastic. To be honest with you, whether you catch a fish or not, and fish are always a bonus, but uh, just being out here in this beautiful river and this beautiful country is where it's at, you know, thanks to Harvey and Steve and Rick and everybody, I'm having a great, great time. But what i got to ask you, Mosh, is is fly fishing what you thought it would be, a little more complicated, or is it it's easier? It's a little bit more of a workout. <laughs> As he hooks the bushes behind him. Uh, well. Yeah, Terry. It's everything I thought it would be. Absolutely. Feed it some line and we'll grab the oars real quick. Here, I think he's... So, Harvey, you've been down here at Pleasure Park for eight years. Yeah, right about that. Somewhere what do you think there. of this stretch of river you guys fish? Oh, I here? love it. Now, what, what all stretches of the river do you cover? We cover from uh, the Smith Fork down. And that's all the Gunnison, or is that the North Fork? Is that all just that's the main, the main, main, main of the Gunnison? Smith Fork down to how far do you go? Uh, we usually just cover down to Drysdale, Austin. So what's a typical drift with you guys? How far? Uh, down here, it's uh, a lot of times we're just taken out at Gunnison River Farms. Uh, good partners with them. And that's, so, uh, that's approximately seven miles. And is that a pretty typical drift? Is that a half day drift? Oh, uh, yeah, if you just drift right through. But you can make Kinda a like day out of it. Kind of like what we're doing, yeah. Yeah, we're going through today because we want to look at some other things. But can you, if somebody wants a full day, you can get them a full day drift? Oh, you bet. Hey, you know what? When, I, when we came in yesterday, we met Leroy. He's kind of an icon and a character, isn't he? Oh, yeah. You Leroy know, but, is Leroy. But what really, uh, the thing that struck me most was his, uh, his sign on the wall. He had the Budweiser. No, Budweiser is not a, not a sponsor of ours, but we'll give him some credit anyway. Um, he sells flies at the bar, and in the morning the guys come in to buy flies. So what he's got a sign up there that was made by Bud for him. It says, "This bugs for you, B U G," and we'll show you a picture of that. And I think that was just—I thought that was so. I mean, it's the little character things like that that can add so much. I mean, to an experience. You go to a place. Now at Pleasure Park, you guys got camping and you've got uh, sleeping cabins. Correct. And uh, how many people, how many cabins are there? There's uh, four, we use three though. Three sleeping cabins and they'll sleep two to three people each. Yeah. And then there's shower and bathroom facilities and you've got campgrounds right there. Yeah. Do most of the people who drift with you camp there, do they stay somewhere else and come in? Oh, a lot of them stay. Uh, you know, some of them like them a little bit better. You know, they like that, uh, you know, toilet right there in the, in the cabin with them and stuff. They don't want to walk outside, go to the facilities over in the other building. But, you mean uh, you had to walk outside to go to the facilities? <laughs> Not the one I stayed in. <laughs> now, where we're getting out, what's the name of it again? Gunnison River Farm. Now, th they have, they've got accommodations there too, right? Yeah. And those are, those are more complete, more, they're not as primitive. Oh, yeah, they got a real nice place down there. And those are probably full plan. They take care of you there, I suppose. Yeah. But you know, you can get it just so there's you can come down here and just have about any experience at any price level you want and any accommodations you want and uh, get in some great fishing. And I mean, what a beautiful place! 
uh, fell in Alaska once told me, you know, Moj, if you fish up front, I'd have a place to cast. <laughs> in front in me, I don't have a place to cast. He hasn't caught a fish all day yet, but he casts right That's in front of me. That's my design, Pete. That's my design. But um, one of the things that fell in Alaska said to me, he said, uh, the reason I love fishing, he said, is because fish live in beautiful places. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the beautiful places. Now, we're about a... What would you say? We're about a five-hour drive from the front range? Yeah, four and a half to five hours. You know, another thing, it's probably not something you guys promote a lot, but we found it coming up here. and We're kind of into wine tasting. So we actually stopped at some of the wineries on the way. So there's lots of reasons you can make a trip up here. You know, the family's into other things, and one member wants to fish. There are a lot of other things to do, just the hiking and the beauty, the wineries. I saw him. I put that, I was picking it up, putting it down. I was only getting about a two-foot drift at a time. And I saw him come and flash. I actually saw him take it. He come up. He came up and just took the fly. Just it was just classic take that you that you always want when you watch fish and dries to watch the fish flash. I saw him about a foot before he hit the fly. Just tremendous. Another another nice another nice Gunnison River trout. I think it's brown. Yeah, it's brown. Ready? Bring his head up. There we go. Good job with the net. I'll tell you, that's another thing when you're fishing with guides. So I'll get the net, you get a swung around. Oh, this is a beautiful, beautiful colors on this fish. You know, one of the great things about taking a guided trip like we're doing here with the guys from Pleasure Park is the fact that they're taking care of you. They're landing the fish, they're putting your leaders on, putting your flies on. You get into a nice fish like this, all you have to worry about is landing it. They're going to take care of managing the boat, getting the net. Uh, just going to take care of you, and that's what's really so great about it. Show you this. The colors on these just golden. The classic colors of the brown, the golden colors. I'll let you get the net out of there. Beautiful colors. That's what you come and oh, there it goes. Looking good, taking off. That's what you come and fish the Gunnison River for. Are those classic brown trout. We're not catching giant fish, but some big fish can come out of here. But those beautiful browns, and we're here, it's uh, getting towards the end of August. And uh, those fish are gonna get more colorful as we get into fall and they get into their spawn and more aggressive. And this is just, this is gold medal waters, right, Harvey? Yeah, well, this up above is. Up above is, so we got a gold medal stretch where there's 10,000 fish per mile. And down here, I tell you what, well, fishing's been great for me. How about you, Moj? Uh, fishing's been great. Uh, the catching's been okay. The landing's been real bad. Yeah, I tell you what, Moj. Three or four fish on the line so far. I just uh, can't get them in the boat, Terry. You're doing a great job, and he's taking those steps. Moj is learning the intricacies of fly fishing. He's finally been making some really great presentations. He's had four fish take, and uh, next time he's going to get one on, and we're going to show you some of that. But it's been, what a beautiful... Next time I'm bringing my 12 gauge, and I'll just take care of it from a distance, okay? No problem. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, we'll get all rigged up here. So we'll take a look at these commercials. When we get back, we'll have more of taking Moj fishing. You know, um, Harvey, you guys fish this river mostly out of inflatables, don't you? Yeah, mostly. Just, um, and you know, these are for people who haven't fished out of these inflatable type. You've seen us drift the hard side boats quite a bit on the show, but actually first time we've done a show out of the inflatables, but you've got nice platforms to sit on, good casting platform up front, and uh, you can handle a little skinnier water, and even a little rougher water with these. There right, you Mo's go, Moe's got Mo. a fish on, all right. Moe's, get, keep get it, the line tight. Keep it tight. Keep tight. No, strip it in, strip it in. Yeah. Strip with your hand. He's gone. There, well. Oh, Mosh. Yeah. Get that line on your finger. Strip it in. Good, <laughs> we had. Oh, it was a big fish too. I mean, these guys are making me angry, is what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Get the line on your finger. You got it on your finger. I You're still it. working the bank over there. Get ready to strip in some. There you go. You won't even get wet. Yeah, how about them apples, huh? Yeah. All right. Ah. Well, i tell you what, I hope you enjoyed that time on the water. What a great stretch of river and what a, some great facilities out there. And you need to get out and take advantage of that. I mean, both Pleasure Park and uh, Black Canyon Anglers, just tremendous, tremendous people helping us out. Really appreciate that. Great, Steve, great time fishing. Well, thank thank you. you. It was awesome. Absolutely. But now people want to know who the gentleman holding the chicken is here. Well, half the story was uh, getting Mark out to get some fish and, and uh, well, <laughs> 
We need to do that again. Well, we will. The other half of the story is to uh, introduce you to uh, Tom Whiting, who uh, started this uh, chicken operation specifically for fly tying feathers. So, mm. this is Tom. Tom Terry, uh, well, you get your hands full, so it won't shake your hand. But uh, well, I've heard of Whiting Farms. Obviously, anybody in the fly fishing industry has. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you guys supply probably the majority of feathers to the fly tying industry. You're the by far the biggest impact in that industry. As far as we know, we are. There's no government figures on it or, it or what, but I think we have probably three quarters of the world market. Now, this isn't a typical chicken. When people think chicken, they usually think of the white thing running around laying eggs, and, and then they think of the Tyson stuff where you get the drumsticks. The chickens you raise are a lot different than that, aren't they? These are totally different than the commercial meat chickens you're referring to. These have been bred for anywhere from 30 to 70 years just for fly tying feathers. And uh, they've been specifically de ha devised to have feathers that are very good and have the characteristics that make a fly stand on the water, and that's why they're called a dry fly. How many different breeds, and what is this particular one? Well, this is probably the most famous, and what we really started with, it's called a grizzly, and the grizzly just denotes that it's black and white barred birds. And this one happens to go back to a line called the Hoffman grizzly, which is what we started the company with in 1989. You know, we're Whiting Farms is located right here in Colorado, a Colorado company. People who would drive by this road outside of Delta would never understand the impact on the flying, fly, fly industry you have because it's kind of unassuming when you drive by. It's, there's no big signs or anything. But, and it looks like just another ranch or farm out here, but how many chickens at one time do you have on the ranch? Well, we actually have three production ranches. We keep things spread out, and this ranch that you're currently on has got about 60,000 birds on it right now. 60,000. How many different breeds? Well, I look at them as lines, not so much breeds. Like this start, started out long ago as a barred Plymouth Rock Bantam, but now it's fairly large. We have about five major product lines that I'd call a breed or a line, and within them there's all kinds of variation on different colors, but that's within each of the lines. Now, I, I, we're not filming in the rooster barns right now, and we may show some of the chicks, I guess, but there's a reason. These, these buildings are kept dark, is that right? Yeah, the birds are... Well, the mature roosters we keep kind of dark because these long saddles, the quieter they are, the less likely they're going to stomp around the cages and take them off. And so we found that they just keep quieter and they're more docile. They do have a lighting program that's specific to make them grow the good feathers, but we just happen to be at the dark period right now. Okay, and, and just uh, where do you ship these feathers to? Who buys these feathers and where do they go? Well, actually, even though we're here in Colorado, we sell less than 2% of our product in Colorado, and half of our total per sales are overseas. Now, those go to commercial fly tying operations? We sell into many different sectors in the world. We sell to commercial fly tying companies around the world, and they're from Africa to China to Thailand to Sri Lanka. Then we sell to retail product to Europe and the United States and Japan and other countries, Australia New Zealand. And then we have a few other... Um, different uses for the feathers as well. Well, we actually worked with Bob Jacklin and produced a fly tying video for Bob and he spoke so highly of Whiting's Farms and the feathers he used from there in his fly shop. And I, I'm sure that all of you out there who tie your own flies are very familiar with the Whiting's. You see them hanging in all the fly shops, but they probably don't buy too many flies. They don't end up getting a Whiting product, do they, Steve? Well, we, we think that if, if uh, three quarters of the world's market is buying our feathers, that's pretty much three quarters of the flies in the world might have our feathers in it too, so. That's pretty awesome. Well, maybe we should show them another chicken or a little bit more of the ranch. Terry, would you look at this little chicken? <laughs> He's gonna grow up and give his life to fly fishing. He's not gonna end up on somebody's dinner table, but he is gonna give his life up to a stream someplace. And here comes uh, Tom Whiting with a whole display of them. Here, if you wanna look at some of the little basic chicks here, these are just some different colors. This black one here with a white dot on its head will end up as that barred Plymouth Rock or grizzly bird. All barred birds have that white dot on their head. This will probably end up a brown. It's got what we call a chipmunk stripe, chipmunk stripe on it. And that one's going to be a dun, which is very important for the mayfly flies. And then this one that's sort of modeled here is a line we do for a gray partridge substitute. Even though it's a chicken, it has feathers like a partridge. Now, I have a question. You you have barns here that just have hens in for breeding? Yes. And so that, and then how do you select the eggs? Do most of the eggs you try to hatch as many as you can, or what's the...? It's a rather complex program where we have one rooster in with about 12 or 14 females in their individual pens, and we pedigree the eggs. We write on what it is. Wow. And we keep track of all that, and that's necessary for the breeding program. And then you can see what's coming out of that, and if you need to make a change, you make a change. That's right.
Well, that, wasn't that something? What do you think about this chicken farm? I'm telling you, Terry, it's uh, unbelievable. I have never seen chickens like that in my entire life. Fascinated that all these chickens are just for tying flies, which shows you how big tie or fly uh, fishing really is around the uh, world of fly tying. I mean, guys are doing it all over the globe. It's hard to believe. Did you have a great experience today? I had a great, great time. You I know, had Moj, an awesome time. I got to talk about Moj. Moj worked so hard today. I'll tell you what. This guy, we had tough technical fishing today. I counted. I had a total of seven strikes myself. Now. First time in a drift boat, hadn't had a fly rod in his hand for 15 years and then hardly at all. To get five fish in that technical adrift to rise to your fly, get a couple of them hooked up, even though you didn't land one, was a great effort and I hope you enjoyed it. But Terry had a great time. Next, next time I hopefully can touch a fish, hold a fish, <laughs> well, get it in the boat, well, that kind of thing. So this is just the first episode of Take Moj Fishing and Catch, him a, catch a Fish, right? Steve, thanks for bringing us out here. Absolutely. Tom, Thank thanks for showing us around. It just, I, I hope people know that next time you're tying a fly and picking out a feather, you see the background of where some of these chickens, where those feathers come from and make it a little more interesting to you. Whiting Farms, I mean, look for the brand. They make the best, best hackle on the market. So, we'll, you know, just go out there and take a look. You dominate the market. Colorado Company. Rick, thanks for running the camera boat. Sure thing. My pleasure. So, Thank you folks for joining us and uh, stay tuned as the saga of getting Mark Mosier a fish continues. Steve and the camera boat got a rainbow on. We got you here. Is that one of them silver ones? Yeah. All right. Get it netted here. All right. Oh. All right. Got him. Well, Steve, that was our first rainbow of the trip anyway. So uh, at least we can show people there are some rainbows here.